Hey Saints, um, I have some more videos I'm putting together. I, I want to do another one on the prodigal son because there's some things in there that I've seen recently that I didn't see before and I really wanted to share with you of how great a father we have. He, he is the hero of that story. But tonight my pastor did a, a nice sermon, a study on seven areas of misplaced love and because you know we're supposed to love God first. And um, as always, you guys know I stand on the finished work of Christ alone. We trust the death, burial, and resurrection of God in the flesh who bore our sin so we get to wear his righteousness. And that alone saves us. Uh, our behavior uh, can determine uh, some serious consequences on this earth. See, God's not mocked. You reap what you sow. A saved person will reap it on this earth. He chastises his children. That doesn't mean he beats them up. That rod and I staff, they comfort me. It kind of keeps the sheep in line because he wants them in a safe place in his will. Okay? It's not because he's mad at you or, you know, uh, you know, any of that. He loves us. And he's our dad. And you surely wouldn't want your child doing something dangerous or destructive. Now, if you're saved, you're going to suffer consequences on this earth. If you're unsaved... You will reap at the end of your life. And that's why we preach the glorious good news. We know that once somebody trusts in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in them, seals them, the Holy Spirit of promise, until the day of redemption, not until you mess up. It's not probationary life or temporary life. It is eternal life, life everlasting. Okay? So, uh, you know, and it says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will, he will convict the world of sin righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on him of righteousness for he goes to the father so he's going to bear witness to those who are righteous and right standing with him because we have God's righteousness we've trusted on him and it says rose again for our justification okay that means to be declared innocent declared righteous so and then the last is to convict of judgment for the God of this world little g God Satan is judged so, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to remind people that that's where your behavior goes. First Corinthians 3 also talks about our works, our good works, uh, whether they abide or not, having a reward or suffering loss of it. Whatever you believe. Some people don't believe in the doctrine of eternal reward. I do. Uh, I believe it's a position thing, and I also believe that you can receive crowns that you can present to Jesus as a gift to him to be able to show that to him, but the greatest reward of all is to hear good and faithful servant, you know, but uh, ultimately the way you please God is to believe him. That's it. Without faith, it's impossible to believe God. I mean, without faith, it's impossible to please God. <laughs> it's funny. Can't believe God without faith. Of course not. Uh, so I just want to, I'm not going to read every scripture, but I'm going to give you the scriptures and tell you the gist of it because it'll just be a short list. This is not my sermon I'm going to give you. I'm just going to give you a summary of what our pastor talked about. And I thought you might enjoy it. Um, some of the ways that our love is misplaced, you know, and sometimes we don't even mean it. We don't even realize it. It's just good to look at these things so that we can grow in grace and be lifted up, you know. But remember, condemnation does nothing. The strength of sin is the law, not grace, you know. Uh, grace helps you abide in Christ and want to come to him and to know more about him and to serve him because you love him. Those forgiven much, love much. And I see people that are resting in God's grace, knowing they didn't have to qualify for it. He took them just as they were. And he will always love them as their beloved, precious, merciful, forgiving father. Uh, and you really want to please your dad because you love him. You know, some people are brats, you know, and they, they, they remain babes in Christ for a while. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, but let me just give you just what he said. And I'll give you some verses. Maybe you'll like this. Um, I've said this before, though. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is just an exchange of goods and services. It's just something we use. And you can utilize it for good or evil. It's the love of money. When you put your trust in it, when you put your security in money, that is the root of all evil. Okay? But money itself isn't. There's many wealthy Christians that use their finances to bless the church and bless others and take care of the poor. You know, so it's not a bad thing. It's the love of it that is. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now, my pastor was talking tonight, seven areas 
of misplaced love. This won't be a really long video. I'm just going to give you the gist of it here. If you go over to John 3:18 through 20, you know, it says, um, he who believes the Son hath life. He who believes not the Son hath not life. And the wrath of God abides on him. Right after, it, can send, it tells you why people won't believe the Son. Okay? Because they love darkness rather than light. So one way we misplace love is to um, love darkness rather than the light. Also, that little section is a nice little eternity, eternal security uh, section. Uh, now, if you go, this is number two. So the first one, that first way we misplace love uh, is to love darkness rather than light. A lot of people don't want to come to Jesus because to acknowledge that you're a sinner requires you to look at yourself and say, uh-oh, I'm not really good, not good enough, I fall short. You know, and that's what the law was for, so that sin might abound, see, to make us guilty before God, so that every mouth may be stopped and be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, to show us our need for a Savior, because we ourselves are not good. All right, let's see. Uh, number two, John 12, 42. Another way that we mi there's misplaced love is loving praises of men more than praises of God. This talks about the Pharisees who did believe on Jesus, yet they didn't tell anybody because they loved praises of men. They were scared they'd be kicked out of their social standing in the synagogue, in the temple. So they didn't, they didn't publicly proclaim it to these people. Uh, now, the other see confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Uh, that is a work. It is not necessary. Like the, you know, you don't have to publicly proclaim your faith in order to be saved. And that scripture clearly says it. Uh, but we, oh my gosh, should we ever, I mean, if, if, if I came to you and said, look, every bill you ever will have and ever had and what you got now is wiped out. In addition, I put a hundred million dollars in your account and every person you tell gets the same gift. Would you not be jumping up and down screaming and calling everybody? Well, the gift that God gave us eternal life to be, to, this, is, this is eternal life that we may know him. Okay. So, you know, that is the greatest gift ever. And so we should be telling every one. Uh, these people love the praise. As you can see, uh, bear witness, uh, when you stand for the gospel of grace, the religious hate it. And they hate me. I told you I get more hate mail than the Aryan Brotherhood and Hitler's family. Let me give you number three. This is 1 John 2.15. Loving the world and the things of the world. You know, uh, a lot of people, I see a lot of churches getting involved in social reformation. Uh, you know the world's not going to be right till the Lord's here. The little G God of this world's got control of all that. You can't, you can't do that. You can't reform this world. Jesus Christ has to come and take it over and wipe that mess out before it's going to be right. Uh, so we don't want to love the things of the world. I'm not saying, oh, you got to stay away from secular music and secular movies. But you know what? There's a lot of things that grieve me. Things that overtly speak against God. And they're very subtle. You know, a lot of little jabs at Jesus and the faith and the Bible. I'm sick of it. It's just little jabs on. And then they make Lucifer the misunderstood good one that just, you know, his daddy's a tyrant. God is just a tyrant. He's like a kid with an ant farm, and he's just stomping on people and indiscriminately killing people because he's so wicked. And all Lucifer wanted to do, or Satan wanted to do, is is give man knowledge. No, he wanted to give us the knowledge of good and evil to break fellowship with God himself because God wasn't keeping anything from us, and he's a liar. So I, I say, I stay away from things that, like, upset me that are overtly against God. Now, I, I like some secular music. I really do. Because I'm an artist. I've been an artist my whole life. I've lived as an artist my whole life. I've made films my whole career. That's what I do. And I relate to the artist. And a lot of music and art and movies are often a person's expression of that artistic voice. And I like it and I acknowledge it and I appreciate it. Um, some people may feel condemned. See, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. It says, blessed is the man who does not condemn that which he allows. And so I enjoy things. I find joy in all things. I thank God for them. And, you know, I, I don't like, listen to Slayer and black metal and stuff, but I love Megadeth and their political 
political uh, lyrics, not not some of their older, darker ones, but I, I really uh, love music and stuff. That doesn't necessarily mean the world. It means that you're, the ways of the world, you know, the standards of the world, the governments of the world, the, the way things work here, instead of desiring righteous things, God's way. And I so crave it. I'm like, Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus, please. It's so dark. It's so dark, and I know all of you are grieved at your core of what we see going on on this earth. But I still say grace, kindness, love, always, always, always err on the side of love and compassion and grace. Just as we have freely been given that. When interacting, someone the other day said, no, you don't, you're not, you don't give grace to an atheist. You don't, I will not talk to goats, but only sheep. Well, you know what? We were all goats one time. Somebody had to be a light to us. And we don't live in a little huddle. And, you know, we're a light. You don't put, what does it say, that old song? You don't, you don't hide your light under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. You've got to let the light shine and be salt to preserve God's way. And the best way is to let people see Jesus in you. With overt sinners, he never spoke harshly, only to self-righteous Pharisees. And a lot of these atheists, they're not really atheists. They have just been hurt by people proclaiming Christ and have just been hypocritical and cruel. And, I mean, we had somebody the other day try to convince a man whose mother is dying that God won't heal. God doesn't heal anymore. And then went on to proceed to try to prove that. God does answer prayer. I had full kidney failure. Okay. No medicine could fix that. And I was healed a few hours uh, before dialysis, and my life was spared. I wasn't healed of all my injuries. I'm still disabled. I still lost a third of my arm. I still have no cartilage in my side joint. But I was healed of the kidney failure, and people prayed over me. Matter of fact, two strangers I never met showed up in my room, left scripture over me, prayed over me, worked. So uh, it says uh, to pray over them, and they will recover. Now, I think he might be confusing that with the apostolic gifts, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about praying to God according to his will and and pleading on behalf of people because the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So anyway, I got off track. Whoa, way over there on that limb. All right, let's go to, so we've got number one, uh, loving darkness rather than light. Number two, loving praises of men rather than the praise of God. Number three, 1 John 2.15, loving the world and the things of the world. Um, now, uh, number four is 1 Timothy 6.8. That's your reference scripture. Loving and having a desire to be rich. Loving money. Not money itself, like I said. The love of money. We, my pastor has a very wealthy multi-millionaire friend, and he gives more to God than he makes in a year. He loves serving God with his money. And he loves it. He lives for it. You know? So, yeah, God can use very wealthy people to bless others. You see in the early church, they were selling property and just giving it to the church. So, uh, But it's when you love that money and trust in that money for your security that, and you worship that money, that makes it evil. Okay? It's the, the love of it. Um... And I really believe that God's grace, I'd like to reiterate, God's grace, when you really get the revelation of it, it does change your heart. Like you, you're grieved, you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, and you just love your dad so much when you find out how much he loves you. It's like these people haven't gotten the fullness of grace, and they don't understand how the love of Christ constrains us, that, that it's his love. It's his love. That is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that brings men to turn to him. So um, now, number five, Matthew 24, 12. Another way love is misplaced is the love of uh, others waxes cold. The people have no compassion. Their love waxes cold. They're cold-hearted, shut down, self-absorbed, don't have empathy for others. Not sympathy, not pity. Empathy. We're told to mourn with them, not say, oh, that's terrible, but let me tell you what I went through, because I totally get it, and mine was worse. No, mourn with that person, and don't take their pain. That's their pain. Let them have that. You know, we need to learn to, to be warmer and more loving, and even if you disagree like the gentleman, I don't think he meant harm, but 
you know, that was really painful. His mother's dying, and all he asked was for, for Christians to come together in prayer for his family. And he couldn't even do that. He had to make him wrong and prove why God doesn't heal anymore. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He healed and rose people from the dead before the cross. Remember? And after the cross. All right? That God can do whatever he wants. And I believe in prayer wholeheartedly. I think there's a lot of hucksters on TV claiming healing and they got to raise millions of dollars for amphitheaters and all that. That's how you serve God, really? You could take that money and, like, help a, a lot of people with that in Jesus' name. So, all right, so the love being misplaced is love waxing cold. Uh, number six, 2 Timothy 3, 1. Lovers of their own selves. It's all about me. Give me me. I am a victim, but I must live for myself. That's have a lot of divorces. No, I know God wants me to be happy, and I'm not happy in my marriage. You know what? Love is not some feeling. That's lust, okay? That's emotionalism. Love is a choice and an action. You decide. I may have the butterfly feelings now, but one day they're going to go away, okay? Because that's just a chemical reaction. Love is a choice saying, I'm going to commit to this person because this is the person God gave to me. And I'm going to find all the good in that person and love them forever and minimize the bad. And I'm going to serve them 100% and they're going to serve me 100%. And both of us are taken care of because we're taking care of each other because God's first. But they don't. It's they love themselves more than anyone. You know, it's all a pride of life. Everything, me, 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 what I want, what makes me feel good. You know? And is there a, a more self-absorbed, self-indulgent, self-entitled generation than you've seen right now? These people, these kids growing up think that they're owed everything. Just give it to them. Now you don't even compete for sports. Somebody's feelings might get hurt, so everybody gets a trophy. And when everybody's, uh, everybody's a winner, nobody is. You know, we're supposed to strive for things. It's good to work for things. Competition's good. It makes you strive for the best. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and everybody has their own area of talent. I, I really hate the lovers of themselves. Me, 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 and how I feel. And the final one is 2 Timothy 3, 4. These are just a reference point for love waxing cold in the particular area that I gave you, how love is misplaced. Instead of loving God, as we're told to do, this is what we're doing with the love. Uh, loving pleasures more than God. So pleasures of the flesh more than God. Uh, and, and then it talks about having a form of godliness, but denying the power of, but I believe that is basically saying that there's a lot of righteous looking false prophets that look like a sheep, but because they look like it outside, you're not going to be overtly sinful. They're going to be, you know, good, righteous men. Satan transforms an angel light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness, but it's going to be the wrong righteousness. Now, they're going to tell you you have to do this and do that to be saved and earn your salvation, qualify for that grace, which is no longer grace. It's death at that point. And it's not Jesus plus anything you're doing. It's all what he did. Now, to tell a person to uh, get rid of sin in their life and to do good works and to love God and be faithful and love one another, those are all sound doctrines when you put them on this side of salvation. All right? When you mix them as part of getting, keeping, or proving salvation— that's when it's heresy, and that's when it's wrong. But once a person's saved, we put them on that side because that's God's will for us, right? That's our purpose. So the very last one is they love pleasure more than that. So these men, uh, the, the, the verse right after it doesn't directly pertain to that, but I wanted to explain a form of godliness denying the power of power thereof. So they'll look righteous on the outside, but they'll deny the power of the cross to save alone. They will deny that. It's going to be a righteousness, a form of godliness, externally keeping these moral laws and looking right, and not drinking and not fornicating and not and all of this. But they deny the power of the cross, the so great a salvation, which is foolishness to them that are perishing, uh, because it's not after man, it's not of yourselves, it's spiritually discerned. Eternal life really is a free gift, and because of that, our love should be all about the Lord. We should be loving God. But again, we don't put trust in our ability to love God. We put our trust in that God first loved 
us and gave his son to wear our sin in his own sinless body as the second Adam so that he can give us his righteousness and that Holy Spirit in us, which cannot sin because it's born of God, not possible to sin, see, right standing with God, uh, as opposed to the old sinful flesh that we're still in, which wars against the spirit. Uh, that body, that, that spirit will be given a glorified body and we will be just like him. It's the first fruits of the resurrected. A lot of good reasons to love the Lord. Um, so that abide in grace and you'll see many more of them. God bless you guys.